Good evening and thank you for joining us. Some unfortunate news to lead off our newscast tonight. Longtime MPP Michael Gravel has announced that the cancer he battled nearly a decade ago has returned. Gravel issued a public statement today confirming a recent biopsy revealed the cancer last week. He'll begin chemotherapy tomorrow. Well, certainly uh, I'm devastated by the news and, and I'm hopefully looking forward to uh, a chemotherapy that will uh, cure me of the disease that I'm, I'm suffering from. I mean, this is cancer is a pretty serious matter. I've gone through it about uh, 10 years ago and got through successfully and hoping I can do that again. Gravel has served as Liberal MPP for Thunder Bay Superior North since 1995, winning seven straight elections. The 73-year-old is still planning to run again on June 2nd, but with the election less than two months away, he admits his illness may not give him that chance. Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca posted about his colleague on Twitter today, and Gravel says Del Duca told him that he'll support whatever decision he makes. What I'm hoping is that uh, I feel much better after the first sessions of the chemotherapy so I can still look at the possibility of being a candidate in the uh, June election. It might be a long shot, to be perfectly honest, uh, because I really have got to make sure that I obviously treat my health first. So um, I love the work that I'm doing very, very much, and I love being an MPP. I'll have to make that decision within the next, probably within the next week or so, uh, seeing how the chemotherapy sessions go. Gravel adds that he'll continue to work from home on constituency matters while he undergoes treatment. Thunder Bay City Council has opted to delay the vote on an enclosed tennis centre in order to get more clarity about possible options. Last night's meeting also saw changes revealed for this year's Canada Day activities, with no fireworks scheduled to take place on July 1st. Corey Nordstrom has the details. 2019 may have been the last Canada Day fireworks put on by the city of Thunder Bay. In a memo to council, the city's event supervisor made note of changes planned for July 1st at Marina Park. Instead, the annual fireworks show will be moved to a live on the waterfront event later in the season. The event will include a stage show, food vendors and community groups similar to previous years. The opening ceremony will include a land acknowledgement and an invite for participation of an elder to provide an opening prayer, as well as Indigenous dancers and drummers. We also hope to include learning opportunity, messaging, Indigenous content where applicable, with the goal of educating. Last year's event was fully virtual, while crowds gathered in a rally to cancel Canada Day, a movement brought on by the discovery of mass graves cross-country as a result of residential schools. The city is looking to make future Canada Day events more inclusive and has consulted local elders and its Indigenous relations team to do so. Also Monday night, Council chose to push back a decision on an indoor tennis bubble at Chapels Park. Administration and the tennis community differed on two options on its placement. Passy Pinta and David Haru favoring option one, directly adjacent to the proposed indoor turf facility. City staffers wanting the bubble across Chapels Drive, out of the eye line for the nearly $45 million indoor turf facility. So I don't know how we're going to know for sure whether there will actually be an indoor turf facility on the chapel site for many months. And of course, if there's not one there, then I would suggest that the concerns from administration are not as relevant. Other concerns at council chambers included operating costs for the options that was not known at the time, eventually leading to a referral of the vote for the bubble until May 9th when administration has compiled a report. The delay likely means there won't be any tennis being played locally this winter. You know, what's another month? I mean, we, we might lose the construction season. It would be disappointing, of course, but... We can't lose sight of the big picture that we, we were trying to achieve. And Jen Salo's request for a portion of the Chippewa Park Wildlife Exhibit was unanimously approved. Administration will work with the owner of the Thunderbird Raptor Rescue to solidify a lease of the three specific areas of the now-closed exhibit. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. The Thunder Bay Airport will see big changes in the types of incoming passenger aircraft this spring and summer. The airport's primary runway will be closed for major upgrades, and the smaller runway can only handle propeller planes. 
As a result, Flair Airlines is putting its Thunder Bay to Toronto route on hiatus from late April until November. Lee Noonan reports. The closure of its primary runway will make the Thunder Bay Airport temporarily unavailable to jet airplanes. Local service from most airlines will continue and even increase with propeller aircraft, which can operate on the airport's shorter secondary runway. But for Flair Airline flights, their fleet of jet aircraft won't be able to safely land here. So their Thunder Bay route will be halted for about six months. Flair, unfortunately, will not be here for the summer. They're uh, very keen on the Thunder Bay market. They were very pleased with how the Thunder Bay market responded to their product. And we'll be back as soon as the primary runway is restored. Spokesperson for Flair says the company is committed to the Thunder Bay market and they look forward to returning at the beginning of November. WestJet and Porter already fly propeller planes through Thunder Bay and are unaffected, whereas Air Canada will be substituting their 78-seat regional jet with a 78-seat Q400 propeller airplane. Schmidtke expects those carriers to increase capacity over the coming months. So this is a back to the future scenario for one summer and then in the fall carriers that uh, have jets will make a decision to return it into the market. Work on the main runway improvements is slated to begin on May 15th and continue until the end of October. We are going to completely restore and rehabilitate our primary runway. Uh, it's, it's a big job. Uh, it uh, requires us to dig down, you know, several meters, or do some subsurface repairs. We're going to update our lighting to state-of-the-art LED. We're going to replace the subsurface drainage. Think weeping tile in your house and how much work that is. Schmidtke does not expect the under-the-surface improvements will be noticeable by travelers, except perhaps in the cost of their tickets. He says the restoration project will mean operational savings and that the significant federal funding the project received will allow the airport to avoid charging an airport improvement fee. Lee Noonan, TBT News. Two people are dead after a head-on crash on Highway 11 in Greenstone yesterday evening. Nipigon OPP say two SUVs collided just after 6 o'clock. 33-year-old Brittany Les Purins of Lake Helen First Nation and 31-year-old Evan Lester of Rocky Bay First Nation were pronounced dead on the scene, and a third person involved in the crash was taken to hospital. The highway was closed for several hours before reopening just after 4 o'clock this morning. Police continue to investigate the cause of the collision. The RCMP has charged five men, including one from Thunder Bay, in connection with the death of another Thunder Bay man at the Stony Mountain Penitentiary in Manitoba. 36-year-old Nathan Otke was found unresponsive in his cell after an assault on January 1st. He later died in hospital. In a media release issued this week, the RCMP says a total of five arrests have been made in connection with Otke's death. Two Manitoba men are charged with second-degree murder and two other men are charged with being accessories after the fact to aggravated assault. The fifth person charged is a 35-year-old Tyler Boyley of Thunder Bay. He's facing one count of being a party to the offense of second-degree murder. RCMP says all five of the accused are currently in custody. Dryden OPP are investigating the death of a 45-year-old man in that city. Police were called to a Memorial Avenue home on Saturday evening where the body of Niall Knutson was discovered. OPP won't confirm whether the case is being treated as a homicide, but the crime unit is investigating. Anyone with information is asked to call police or Crime Stoppers. Turning now to the pandemic, Ontario Health Minister Christine Elliott says the province will expand the eligibility for a fourth COVID-19 shot. This comes as the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations has provided initial recommendations on a fourth dose. Siobhan Morris reports. In this sixth wave, the number of people in Ontario hospitals with COVID-19 has soared. Nearly 1,100 people with the virus are in hospital. That's 38% more than just a week ago. Among those admitted are some of the youngest Ontarians. Over the last two weeks, public health says 89 children with COVID-19 have been admitted, 55 of them younger than five, too young to be vaccinated. The health minister insists this shift is not a surprise. This is something that when you're opening up the province to the degree that we have and with the transmissibility of this virus, that we expected to see the numbers increase, but we have over 3,100 extra beds. We have the capacity. We have simple, easy, effective tools to help at least mitigate 
this wave. In the form of a well-fitting mask. While they're no longer mandatory in most settings, Dr. Isaac Bogosh hopes Ontarians will keep wearing them anyway. It will protect themselves. It will protect those around them. It'll create a safer indoor space. And, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do, especially when we're seeing this this rise in cases. Also a potential help to keep people out of hospital is a second COVID-19 booster vaccine. And NASI says anyone 80 and older should get one. Ontario is going further. Our medical advisors have recommended that on Ontario that we uh, go to 60 to provide an added level of protection to um, the residents of Ontario. Details on the rollout are expected tomorrow. That was CTV's Siobhan Morris. Well, here at home, the number of COVID-19 patients at the Regional Health Sciences Centre has increased slightly over yesterday. There are now 19 COVID patients being treated there, up from 18, and the number of ICU patients has increased from 7 to 8. The hospital's overall occupancy rate is now 104%, while the occupancy rate inside the intensive care unit has jumped to 100%. On the COVID-19 vaccination front, 526 dosed, doses were administered across the Thunder Bay District Health Unit catchment area last week. That's 63 more shots than the week before. According to the Ministry of Health, 89.5% of people in the district aged 5 and up have gotten at least one dose, while nearly 86% have received at least two shots. Thunder Bay is getting ready to host the 2022 National Martial Arts Championships in late July. The event was originally supposed to take place here in 2020, but was delayed due to the pandemic. This is the first time a martial arts event of this stature will take place in Northern Ontario. About 500 of the best athletes in the country will compete in a martial arts of Wushu Kung Fu. The winners will then get to represent Canada in international competitions. Along with the athletes, another 1,500 people will come to the city from July 28th to the 31st for the event that will be hosted at Lakehead University Fieldhouse. Wushu Host Committee Chair Brian Niemannen says although there won't be any locals competing, the city's Tai Chi practitioners may be involved somehow, and he explains what kind of styles will be showcased. There's, there's two types of competition going on. There's Sanda, which is free-form fighting. So for people that are into that, that's going to be really uh, you know, a big attraction for, for viewing, right? And then there's high-performance uh, routines. So there's fighting and routines are the two the two main uh, style or types of uh, uh, martial arts going on. In addition to competi competition, the event will also feature a Kung Fu Masters Performance Gala to kick off the four-day event. Niemannen says it will be unlike any local spectators have seen since. Well, it's been a winter season to remember for snowmobilers who enjoy the more than 300 kilometers of Thunder Bay Adventure Trails but now that sledding season has come to an end. The groomed trails start at Kekebeka Falls and stretch to the Gravel Lakes, Shabaqua, and Silver Mountain. The trails also connect to seven other clubs in the district, including trails that reach the Manitoba border. The local group typically closes the trails sometimes, sometime in March, but this year they extended that to the end date, or extended the end date rather, due to uh, due to the good conditions this year, grooming coordinator Adrian Tessier says this winter's cold weather and wet snow did cause some hassles with the equipment, but he calls this season an especially good one for the sport. Tessier says they're still closing the trails after today, even though the forecast for this week has changed from rain to snow. The restoration of the Chippewa Park carousel is getting close to completion and the Thunder Bay carvers have played a big part in it. The group's members have been busy crafting all the intricate wooden pieces that had to be replaced before the carousel's grand return this summer. Vasilios Bellos has the story. Members of the Thunder Bay carvers have years of experience under their belts and were all excited to help out with the Chippewa Park carousel project. Their passion and talent for the craft becomes clear after seeing some of the pieces they're contributing including horses' heads, seating, and revitalized mirrors for the ride. Rick Dowswell is with the Thunder Bay Carvers and says the group has been excited for the project right from the start. They were wound up for it, and, and uh, it went well. I think it was a, it, one of the biggest projects I think the Thunder Bay Carvers have ever taken on. And at times it was a little overwhelming, but uh, we stuck it out, and uh, we're going to get it done. You know, I, I remember taking my kids there, and I think lots of, lots of 
people in Thunder Bay are, are going to notice that and say, hey, let's go take our grandkids out there now. And uh, I think it'll go over very well. The Thunder Bay Carver's past work shows a clear talent for the craft. Despite this, members like Terry Herzig feel the Carousel Project specifically has offered a new and exciting challenge. I never ever thought it would we'd get into this, but uh, it, it has been really uh, an experience. Uh, I have learned a lot about that type of carving uh, uh, that I had never done before, but uh, it's, been, it's been a real experience. The carousel and the other rides at Chippewa are set to make their grand return this summer. After two years being shut down due to COVID restrictions, the rides will open to the public in early June, but only on weekends, before switching to five days a week in July and August. City Parks Manager Corey Halverson says they plan to have the carousel running on opening weekend, even if the restoration project still has some finishing touches left to do. It's possible that we'll be able to get all of the... Uh all of the work complete prior to the start of the season, but we'll, it'll be, we'll be assessing that as we get closer because we don't want to impact the opening date for the, uh, for the ride operations for this summer. So there may be some, some components that are, are left to uh, uh, after the season of operations. Vasilios Bellows, TBT News. Well, Mitchell Ringo's joining us now. It's been a while.